Hey guys, Pastor Matt here. Um, one of our visions at the Village Church is we want to be a place that resources liberally the Big C Church of Jesus Christ. And if by His grace we might leave a kingdom legacy with those resources, we want to be all about that. And so thanks for watching this sermon or preparing to watch this sermon. I, I'm praying that you're watching this in community, in conjunction with your ongoing discipleship at a local church. And if, by the grace of God, this becomes one of those things that continues to build up your faith, encourage your walk, fuel your love for Jesus, would you consider giving to the ministries of the Village Church? It's actually really simple. You could either do it in the app or you can go to thevillagechurch.net backslash give and do it there. I hope that the next chunk of time as you watch this sermon, you find your affections for Jesus soaring you find courage flood back into your bones, and you fall more deeply in love with Jesus than you are at this moment. God bless you. Well, good morning, TVC family. My name is Steve Ray. I serve in the production and worship services here at the village. Our passage this morning is out of Luke chapter 15, verses 25 to 32. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Steve. Hey, good morning. Once again. Hey, uh, as we get started, I got two announcements for you. The first one is really exciting. I want to share in an update on our expansion plans because we asked you guys to pray and the Lord has given favor. So last week on Monday night, we took all the pretty pictures of the parking garage and we went for a, uh, well, for a meeting with the Planning and Zoning Committee and we talked with them and they thought, they told us, hey, we love this. This is great. Go, green light, right? Which is huge, that's a huge thing. We've been asking for favor with that. And then Thursday night, uh, we met with the Flower Mound Town Council and we took the whole shebang, the whole expansion plan to them and said, this is what we'd like to do. And every member of the council talked about how good they thought it would be for the community, how excited they were for us, and they had a unanimous approval of our plan. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. That's big, that's really big. So what that equates to for us is a green light to get, a, get rid of shuttles starting next year, uh, but after we build the parking garage. So that's gonna happen uh, over here. We're gonna break ground in January to begin moving to not have to be a burden on the community anymore with all of the cars, all right? And then you don't have to park in the ATM line for the bank. <laughs> Just saying this is what we're trying to help you do. Uh, second is that I'm here because Matt and Lauren are marrying off their oldest daughter, Audrey, today. Yeah. Now, if you, if you recall a few weeks ago, he said this, and you might recall 14-something years ago that Matt said this. While he was in his battle with cancer, there were two things that he was just really hoping the Lord would let him see. It was his boy to become a man and his girls to get married. And this month, he celebrated Reed's 18th birthday. And today, he's going to do his best to hold it together <laughs> as he walks Audrey down the aisle, trades places with Josh, and then officiates his daughter's wedding ceremony. So you can pray for him and Lauren for that, because I don't think I'm going to be able to do that when that day comes. But what a sweet grace of the Lord. Just what a sweet grace of the Lord to preserve his life and to let him see those things 
amidst every other thing that's been done. So that's really sweet. Uh, now, today in our time, I'm going to run the risk uh, that you've heard or read what is often called the parable of the prodigal son. Is that fair? I don't often want to make an assumption about Scripture, but this one's been done. Um, Now, what I want to do today is to talk about a character in the story that's the one that I have most often identified with. In fact, the one that I am most often embarrassed to identify with, and the one that I wish I could desperately be free of, the older brother. Uh, Of the two sons, I know that many of you may relate primarily to the prodigal. You've run far after your own desires, you've made a mess of things, and by grace, you've come to your senses, and you've come to know the love of God that has forgiven you, and you have repented in return and come to live with hope in Christ. And I can tell you that I have often known grace in theory, and I struggle to accept it in practice. Oh, I have often known grace in theory and I struggle to accept it in practice. I can admit my idea, my need for the idea of grace. Like it sounds good. There's this idea that I'm, I'm like, I'm with you, but then I will turn around and live like everything about my standing with God depends on what I do. And therefore, every inch that I earn, I have to fight to protect from loss. Because if I live that way, if I lose it, I have no other standing to trust. The first half of high school, I chased anything but Jesus. I was at church. I was born on the church steps, baptized at a young age. There, I chased anything but Jesus, first half of high school. The second half of high school, I chased the Lord in moral conformity with such conviction and zeal as only a 16, 17-year-old can have, Right? And defined my life more about what I didn't do than what I did do. I was the consummate student leader and was often praised for what, for all intents and purposes, looked like spiritual maturity. Uh, the summer after I graduated high school, I had always, always been a reader. I read a book by a Franciscan priest, which you have to understand was a far cry for a kid from a Baptist red carpet, white column church. Like, read a book by a Catholic priest. Like, this was... But... A guy named Rich Mullins had written one of the forewords, and I had just learned the Apostles' Creed from Rich Mullins, though I thought, maybe this is a good deal. And so I read this book, Ragamuffin Gospel. Any of you familiar with this book? Yeah, none of you who didn't holler for Rich Mullins, so you need to go and listen to the Apostles' Creed. Uh, But Rich's book, it was a turning point for me, because the God he spoke of was not how I related to God through my right behavior. The grace he spoke of was too risky, too free, too open-handed, and felt too uncontrolled for me. I thought, how can you trust that? How did you earn that? Brennan was a monk who became a priest who spoke openly about his battle with alcoholism and the grace that never let him go. I went on to read five or six of Brennan's books and You hear of someone who is so in touch with his brokenness, so in touch with his need for grace that he would talk to you about how he had relapsed and woken up face down on the street in New Orleans to be met with the grace of Christ again. A year or two later, I came across Henri now, and he's French, guys, okay? (laughs) Henri, it's not Henry. Uh... Henri Nouwen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. Any of you know this book? I'm just feeding your Amazon list here. That's what I'm doing. Um, (laughs) You'll notice Rembrandt's famous painting of the parable here on the cover. Nouwen spent a great deal of time meditating on the text and painting. In fact, he spent a great deal of time sitting directly in front of this painting in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Like, he got a connection. Knew somebody, knew somebody, put a chair for him in the middle of the museum and closed off the wing where where the painting was. And he sat with the painting and just meditated on it and the text. And this book is the fruit of that. Now, this book was a really painful, painful read for me because it cut true. You ever have a book like that? Like you, you want to quit it, but you just can't because it's so true. 
And what hurt for me was that I read myself in those pages, not as the prodigal, but as the older brother. The one who lived at home but refused to enter into joy. Who is as much a slave to his desires as his younger brother, but blinded by resentment, entitlement, and fear. So I know you've most likely read the parable. I want to read it again for you to focus on our anchor passage. So here we are, Luke 15. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country where he squandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And now the older son was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and treated him, but he entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you. I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now, can you hear the tone of the older brother? Like, hear it again. Look, I've done everything I knew you wanted. I've taken care of our things, and I'm the one who's been here ready to take care of you when the time comes. I have served you like a slave. I've never disobeyed you, and you've given me nothing. But this one who went out and disobeyed you, disrespected you, dishonored us, he comes back and you celebrate him over me? It's been 20 years since I read Manning and uh, Nouwen's words for the first time. I've been a father for half of that now. And I think about my heart for my children, my heart towards my parents, and my heart before God. I think about our desire for love, the fight for respect, the want of being honored, the drive to do what's right, and the self-centered resentment when I struggle to celebrate someone else because I wish it would have been me. This summer I was on a backpacking trip and I read the father's words to the older son. I was out away from all the noise, no distractions, no phones, just a tent and a backpack reading what the father said to the son. And I heard the still small voice of God inviting me to trust again that the father's words were for me. And it struck a chord in my heart that honestly I hadn't felt in a while. A few weeks ago at our staff retreat, I'm reading a commentary on this passage and it really frustrated me, really made me mad because it cut true. 
it felt like another moment of invitation from the Lord. I think each of us have some primary themes or narratives that we will battle our entire lives. There are assumptions, agreements, beliefs, there are stories we tell ourselves, there are things that we will battle our entire lives. And as the Lord grows us up, we will become aware of them to greater and greater degrees. And as the Lord grows us up, Lord willing, we will repent of them to greater and greater degrees by trusting God's word over our own. So reading that afternoon, felt like a moment the Lord reminded me of my own tendency to get lost at home. I'm gonna read you from this commentary. The writer says, it's easy to see how lost the prodigal son was but do you see how lost the older brother was? He was as lost as his, as his little brother, maybe even more lost, because he was lost on the inside, not on the outside. So nobody could tell how lost he really was. Even though he had never left the family farm, he had abandoned his father's heart, and thus he was lost in his own home. I don't want to over-torque the parable, so I'll tell you outright, I think all Christians are both brothers at some point in their life. I think all Christians are both brothers at some point in their life. We are the prodigal running from God, and we are the older, at home and offered joy, but settling for duty. We can be both saved from our sin and then judge others who confess theirs. We are sinners turned saints who sin. And we are prone to distrusting the grace that made us saints. We are prone to trusting what we can do for God over God and who he is. You know I like questions. Some of you don't like that I like questions, but you're here. And so I have questions for you, just a pulse check. The first question is this. Is worship difficult for you? Not style tone, volume, chorus, or content, but worship. To offer a sacrifice of praise to God. To be thankful from the core of your being, delighting and in celebrating God from the heart. Is it hard for you? Is it a challenge? And if it is, do you know why? Second question, are you frustrated with God? Frustrated is a nice word, so we'll, we'll say, are you angry with God? Just trace that word down the feeling we don't get to angry, right? Are you angry with God, disappointed, mad, embittered, resentful with God because he has not treated you like you think you deserve? hasn't provided for you in the ways that you think he should or how you thought life would turn out? Are you disappointed with God's provision, with God himself? Third question. Is it hard for you to celebrate others with your whole heart? Hear someone else get praised and do you think, Oh man, they deserve that so much. That's so great. I'm so happy for them. And you just clap with a whole heart. Or do you think, if they knew what I knew, none of you would be clapping? (laughs) Just keep clapping. But if you knew what I knew, that person, yeah, sure, okay. Or it's, how come no one saw me? Like, I'll clap for them, but I'm really like, I deserve that more than they do. That's my spot, not theirs. When's it going to be my turn? Ever feel that? Again, the commentary that, well, actually, no, I got one more question for you. I know you want to be done with questions. It's the last one. Why do we live with a fear of never having enough love, respect, or attention? Why do you live with a fear of never having enough love, respect, or attention? And then, do you feel like you have to protect the love, respect, and attention you have for risk of losing it. 
Why do we feel like we have to perform to be known and loved? Because I'll tell you, if you have to keep performing to be loved, it is not love. Commentary. It says, rather than seeing ourselves as desperately needy sinners, we see ourselves as people who basically do what God wants us to do. We think that we are good people who deserve a greater reward, not bad people who can be saved only by grace. Even if we first came to God like the prodigal son, we have gradually turned into the elder brother. See why I didn't like it? Yeah. So I would ask you this. Do you see yourself? You see parts of yourself in these questions or in this commentary? See attitudes of your heart before the Lord in these questions? Have you or are you in danger of turning into the older brother? Are you in danger of getting lost at home? We aren't unlike the church in Galatia. We come to Christ by faith, but we're all tempted in one way or another to stay with Christ through duty. We're all tempted in one, in one way or another to prove that we actually belong. Here, I think our enemy takes God's good call to pursue, pursue virtue in the spirit, and he twists it. He twists it so that we think we're earning something by walking in holiness. He makes it about our worthiness in comparison to others or in comparison to our younger selves. He's doing anything he can to sabotage joy and get us to believe that you can add to grace. And I firmly believe that our world fosters older brotherness. Our world values older brotherness. The need to create and continually perform an identity is common in our culture. Like conservatives and liberals alike are entrenched older brothers, self-righteous in the vision of right living, bitter and resentful at threats to their chosen identity. And nearly every part of society has chosen a stance of superiority. Every part of society has chosen a stance of superiority and fights scarcity for the things that they value to bring identity, purpose, and belonging. We resent others, we're skeptical of them, we lose sight of the humanity in front of us because if our views aren't right, then who are we? When there's a person created in the Imago Dei, the image of God in front of us. Some people have so bought into an ideology of having to create and perform their own identity that when it stops serving them, because it will, that when it fails to bring the thing that it promises, they feel like they are in too deep, have gone too far, and can't get out. Some people are so blinded by rage, resentment, and anger that they can't see the way out, even if it's right in front of them, inviting them into the party. Because pride makes you blind to humility, even being an option. Pride blinds us to humility. And then there's the Father inviting us in, inviting us in to celebrate another who's come home. And some of us have built the life we think that honors God. We've limited our bad habits. We've provided for our families. We work hard and we try not to get rowdy too often. A little bit, not too often. Uh, we clean it up when we need to, right? Like you've, you've learned what to say around who and what not to say around who. You don't talk about where you went the other night and you say, pray, like, praise the Lord and amen at the right time and you kind of shade yourself from shame. Yes. We know how to play that game. Yes. And we come to church because we want our kids to hear the truth and we like preaching that gets in our face and then we leave and go back to what we think is, is right. And then some of us are angry in the middle of all this because you think you deserve more from God. Like you're not walking around saying God deserves me more or God owes me more, but in your heart, you are bitter, you are resentful because you think God owes you and you deserve more from him. So life isn't how you wanted, so why have you tried so hard to please God anyway? 
You begin to become embittered. And then some of you are bored. Some of you are bored because you're not sure what to do next. You've climbed all the mountains. On our little diagram, you chased all the squiggly lines of success and comfort. And you, you don't know what to do next. And you think, okay, so is this it? Is this all I've done? What happens is you've gotten to, to-, to the top of all the ladders you've chased and they are not those in God's good design. And you might help, I mean, you might not want to grow in holiness because you just feel like you should grow in holiness. That's what I'm supposed to do, it's what they tell me. But there's an altogether difference between you should and the fact that God is good. And you move towards him because he is what is right and good. And some of us are just tired, to constrain our, try, tired of trying to constrain our appetites. Like the world tells you, you don't have to constrain nothing. Don't worry about it. But to live is to have discipline. To live is to have limits. To live in God's design is to have right limits and right fashion. But we don't want, we get tired of constraining our appetites, our budgets, and our attention. So we let it leak out in small ways that we think don't hurt anybody. So we can buy things, we can treat ourselves, we can watch this, we can read that, we can give our minds to this, all in a way of thinking, well, it's not really hurting anybody. And what happens is you are lessening God's standard for yourself, and you are lessening accountability for yourself, because you think, I can handle it. But if you're bored, resentful, angry, you're tired, because you've tried to do the right thing the wrong way, you haven't even done the right thing because it's about our hearts not being lost at home. I was talking with a friend last week whose pastor had a moral failing and was removed from his position. I've had this friend for 25 years. And she said, all of a sudden, here was this person who I thought I knew. This person who I thought I understood. And then you realize you never really know someone unless they want to be known. You never really know someone unless they choose to be known. So many of us come to Christ as a prodigal, dependent on grace and amazed by God's love. But then along the way, we believe the lie that Christians shouldn't struggle with sin anymore. Oh, it's just me, okay. We believe the lie that Christians shouldn't struggle with sin anymore, and if we do, it's certainly not something we talk about. Let's let's talk about this. It amazes me in my own heart when I see it that I have a need that Christ provides for me a need that I cannot meet on my own because I have been tarnished head to foot to the core of my being with a desire to rebel against God. I mean, you just leave me alone with my thoughts and you can see depravity. And what I need is grace to not only try, like to not want right things alone, but to be born again. And that's the essence of becoming a Christian is I have a need I can't meet and God has met it for me by giving his son. And so therefore, for my need to be met, for me to have any hope of being different, of living how God wants me to live, I have to have Jesus. And that is grace. And so we come to, we come to God because of grace, because of his love as a prodigal. And then how far is it between that and the time that you, you just tried really hard not to do the thing, and then you did the thing, and you're like, well, shoot, I can't tell anybody. Like, if I tell them, they're going to know that I'm a sinner. They're going to know that I'm prone to not follow God's way 100% of the time, and I'm not perfect. Like, if you're sitting in this room, I really hope that you know. Yeah, you're not alone. Like, how, how freeing is it? How freeing is it in that moment to go... Like, I will talk to myself. You ever catch me in my car? I I turn the radio on or off, but I talk to myself so it doesn't look like I'm crazy. And I say, Mason, you're an idiot. Why are you surprised? Why Why are you shocked that you are yet in need of grace? In Brennan's book, he says this. He says, it's Sunday worship, as in every dimension of our existence, many of us pretend to believe that we are sinners. 
Consequently, all we can do is pretend to believe that we have been forgiven. As a result, our whole spiritual life is pseudo-repentance and pseudo-bliss. So I invite you to consider that you are not you are not going to find what you're looking for with pseudo-repentance. The life that God offers you in Jesus is more than pseudo-bliss. But you have to come to terms with the fact that you are actually a sinner. I'll tell you, the older brother lost sight of his need, but he had a firm grip on his rights. Firm grip on what he thought he was entitled to. And I think about the father who loves his son simply because he does. Simply because he does. I think about my children who I love no matter what good they do and no matter what bad they do. And to my shame, it took me having kids to realize that that has been my parents' stance towards me in my entire life. They felt it then and they feel it now. Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. Some of you know I like to paraphrase the text so here's my paraphrase. Son, I love you. I have always loved you. You have done the right thing for the wrong reasons. And it's taken your heart away from mine. You can't see it right now. But celebrating your brother is right because he was lost and has been found. And you, son, are lost. But you can be found right now. You just need to repent of your goodness. So I read this phrase, repent of your goodness, in a sermon from Tim Keller, which I gotta tell you is a bad idea if you're gonna preach something. Like, don't, don't go read one of Keller's sermons about the same text, because you'll just be like, what am I doing? I'm not... Just pack it in and read his manuscript. Um, (laughs) But I've been haunted by this phrase. What does it mean to repent of my goodness? So I'm not going to wild out. I'm not going to stop doing the things that the Bible tells me I should do. That would be foolishness. But I think repenting of our goodness means working until we see God, ourselves, and others clearly. And we realize that all is grace. All is grace. And God is loving to his children. We repent of our goodness by trusting that grace is real. And then we cultivate a gratitude for the life we're given in Christ. No more pseudo sinners. But we admit that we are outright sinners in need of outright repentance because we have been forgiven fully, freely, and forever. Anything else is to risk being lost at home and to grow with resentment and anger. Recently, I was sitting with a brother who was telling about his experience in AA. And for those of you who are familiar with that community, uh, he was a believer and then went into AA and said that he found grace in a new way through the honest self-assessment of each member the way in which relapses were handled in the community because there are real people trying to find their identity out of God's good design, acknowledging their need, acknowledging their brokenness and their failures, and they are being picked up by grace and called forward. That's something you see here on Wednesday nights in our recovery ministry on a weekly basis. It's something you see, because, but you might not be familiar with it because that's for people who need grace. 
you might not be familiar with it because the self-righteous think, I am not the sick. I've talked about this before, but do you know what happens when you reveal the things you're ashamed of to another Christian? And that Christian receives you with the comfort and grace that Christ has received them with. Do you know what happens? Your physical brain changes. The power of the Holy Spirit in God's design, your physical brain changes to where you can hear rightly. You can see rightly. You can feel rightly. And you can know what it is to be loved. Older brothers and sisters are looking for all of that by performing and being perfect. Because we think that's what God wants. Manning said in a prayer time that he had that he heard this from the still small voice of God that the Lord said, little brother, little brother, I expect more failure from you than you expect from yourself. I expect more failure from you than you expect from yourself. Gosh, what freedom to receive grace in those words. Not to receive license, but to receive grace. Around the time I read those two books that I showed you, I was in a Bible study with some friends. We were walking through Romans. And uh, we were using these hardback, black and white ESVs, listening to some guy named John Piper on these things called podcasts. And uh, we were... We were walking through Romans, and after a decade plus of following Christ, it was my freshman year of college that the Holy Spirit met me outside the party. That the Holy Spirit entreated me and helped me see that I didn't choose to love Jesus on my own, and God didn't know me. He showed me that I was dead and had been made alive. And that it was sheer loving grace from a holy God that caused me to be born again. And I will tell you, born on the church steps, in church all of growing up, I will tell you that at that age, it was the first time in my life that I cried tears of gratitude. Because I saw and tasted grace for what it was. I said earlier, I think the Christian life is an ongoing process of change until the day that we meet Jesus. And so I want to close with more questions. You're welcome. I know you wanted them. First question. When was the last time you felt gratitude for grace at a deep heart level? When was the last time you were so moved by both your need and God's provision for your need, his forgiveness, his love towards you. When was the last time you were so moved that you were overwhelmed yes. by it? Yes. Next question. Where do you act like God owes you because of your goodness? Where do you act like God owes you because how good you've been for him. The invitation is, are you ready to repent of that? Are you ready to turn from that? The last question. What keeps you from seeing what you have been given in Christ? What keeps you from seeing what you have been given in Christ? What are you giving yourself to? What are you feeling entitled to? What are you distracted by? What noise is there in your life where you cannot hear the still small voice of God that would say, little brother, little sister, you are lost at home. That would call you in and give you grace. All of life is a gift, is a gift and all of it is grace. So the quicker we see this and we're shaped by this, the more fully we can enter into the Father's joy. And so uh, prayer team and communion team, if you want to come on up, we're going to just, we're going to roll right into that today. And I'll tell you this, if you're here and you're not a Christian, if you don't believe in Jesus or you're unsure, the free gift of grace is that you can become a child of God now. Now. And where you have tried to find your identity, your purpose, or a place, and it's led you to self-centeredness, darkness, loneliness, 
anger or futility, you can find true life in Jesus. You can enter into joy and be celebrated by a father who loves you. If you want to know more about how to do that, these men and women up here will talk with you and pray with you and share with you. If you recognize yourself as an older brother or sister and you say, I want to quit, God, give me grace to quit, and you want to say that out loud, come and talk with someone up here. Don't go, oh, I'll do it later or I'll have a conversation where it's safe and comfortable. Repent. Your joy is at stake. Perhaps you want to be baptized. We can do that now. So I'll tell you this. Luke tells us that Jesus is sitting there with uh, tax collectors and sinners. And the spiritual elite, the Pharisees, see him and they're like, look at this guy. What a joke. How do you take him seriously when he eats with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus is telling stories about those people, so it kind of all goes together. And he's having this meal with tax collectors and sinners, and you and I are about to take a meal because one day we're going to sit with him. One day hope becomes sight, and this meal that he had with his friends the night that he was betrayed is the meal that we, will, we eat together recognizing that we are the same as tax collectors and sinners and that we are in need of Jesus who has become our friend and older brother. So we serve communion primarily for our members, but if you're a baptized believer in good standing with the church you're visiting from, oh, shoot, let's eat together. We're going to eat together for a long time in eternity. If you're not a believer, the call for you is to take hold of Jesus, not this little cup, but Christ. And so, beloved, the night that Christ was betrayed, he's having dinner with his friends, and he, he takes the bread. He unwraps the cup. No, he takes the bread. <laughs> and he breaks it, and he says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he takes the cup, and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. The bride of Christ is the blood of Christ. Shed for you. Take and drink. In just a second, uh, we're going to sing our gratitude to the Lord, but I want to pray, and then we'll do that together. Would you please join me? Heavenly Father, would you please help us repent where we have become lost at home? Would you help us see rightly and receive and accept grace. If we need to run to you for the first time, would you give us boldness of desperation of need? And may we sing to you with hearts that are full of gratitude. Pray in Christ's name, amen.